Hello church, today is Palm Sunday. This marks the beginning of the Holy Week and also the final week of our Lenten journey together. Palm Sunday is the day in which we commemorate Jesus' courageous entrance into Jerusalem, which kicked off the week in which he was arrested, convicted, crucified, and most importantly, resurrected. But all worldly boo points, Jesus is about to have a week of nothing but failures. But these failures were sufferings that concentrated God's nature of love with mankind's natural to control, nature to control and dominate. Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. He washes his disciples' feet. A close friend betrays him. He spat on, abandoned, beaten, whipped, tried, and convicted of being king of the Jews, which is exactly what he was and is. And finally, he was crucified, dead, and buried. These events contrast God's holiness with humanity's sinfulness. When something is put under force and trauma, you find out what it's made of on the inside. What do you get when you squeeze a lemon? Lemon juice. What do you get when you squeeze an orange? Orange juice. What happens when the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God, rides into town on a donkey, stoops to wash his disciples' feet, is betrayed by a trusted friend, is spat on, abandoned, beaten, whipped, tried, convicted, crucified, died, and buried. What do you get when that happens? You get a crystal clear picture of God's core nature of self-given love. Jesus endured the cross events in order to save humanity. There was no other alternative. And in doing so, he demonstrates that he is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, who came into the world to save the world, not to condemn it. Today, we're going to focus on his courageous entrance into Jerusalem. Let's go to the story. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethlehem on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her coat by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. Say to the daughter of Zion, Say your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a coat, the foal of the donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the coat and placed their coat, their clothes on the for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their clothes <coughs> on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who <coughs> comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heavens. 
when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The story begins with Jesus approaching Jerusalem. Before he enters, he <coughs> sends two of his disciples into the village to return with a donkey and her coat. The disciples do what they were told. They return with the donkey and Jesus rides slowly into town. The text says that this was done to fulfill a prophecy from Zechariah who envisioned the Messiah would come gentle and riding on a donkey. There are a couple of things going on here which are important. First, riding into Jerusalem on a donkey is a highly intentional move by Jesus. In the ancient world, if a king rode into town on a horse, he intended war and aggression. But if he rode into town on a donkey, he had intended peace. Jesus rode into town on a donkey to demonstrate his kingship will be one of peace. The passage from Zechariah continued, I will take the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bowls will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nation. His rule will extend from sea to sea. This is a messianic prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling. He is the anointed one, the Messiah, the king coming into town proclaiming peace instead of conflict. The war is over. There will be no more violence. I don't think the disciples nor the crowd fully understood what Jesus was doing right before their eyes. The Gospel of John says, at first the disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Secondly, Jesus is proclaiming himself to be king. And that is no small thing. The crowd declares Jesus to be the prophet from Nazareth. But that's not what Jesus claims for himself. He was more than a moral teacher and more than a prophet. He was and is the king, the Messiah. During his life and ministry, Jesus consistently demonstrated true authority. Jesus had and still has all authority over nature, demons, sickness, and death. He spoke with authority. And not like someone who memorized all the right answers. He protected people from storms and waves, healed them from blindness, leprosy, and fever, set them free from evil spirits and demons, and more. At Jesus' word, the de devil left him. Demons left. Fevers disappeared and paralyzed went away because he had all authority over them. Nature had to obey him because nature is under his authority. The devil and his demons had to obey him because they also was under his authority. The same with sickness and disease. They are fully under his authority. Just as God spoke 
the cosmos into existence in Genesis. Everything under Jesus' authority must comply with whatever he speaks. Because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The early Christians understood their creed was Jesus is Lord. The word, the word Lord meant absolute authority. It was not a fancy way of saying Mr. as in Mr. Jesus. When they confessed Jesus is Lord, they were proclaiming his complete authority over everything in this world. Nature, sickness, demons, death, and themselves. This proclamation got them killed. By the way, because only Caesar was Lord. The Christian's proclamation was punishable as treason. While Jesus was, bru was brutal against severe weather, demons, and sickness, he was loving, welcoming, and direct with people. This is the Jesus who ate with tax collectors sat with sinners and let sinful women wet his feet with their tears. He touched the untouchable. He loved those who were oppressed and loved their oppressors. Why? Because God did not send his son into the world to, to get, condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus used his authority to save, heal, and make people whole. He never used it for selfish purposes or right to his displays of power. He used his authority humbly as a way to demonstrate God's self-given love in ways consistent with his mission. Here's the question, though. Jesus has all authority over nature, sickness, demons, and death, but does he have all authority over you? Meaning, are you truly his disciple? I don't mean have you accepted some creed about him, but do you trust in him as the Lord of your life? Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem has been planned. And it wasn't on a whim. Before Jesus rode into town, he needed a donkey. So he sent his disciples to fetch one that he had in mind. He gave them instructions that if anyone questions why they want the donkey, they were simply to say the Lord needs them. Mark tells us that in the village of Bethany, where Jesus recently raised Lazarus from the dead, <coughs> no doubt Jesus knew a lot of the people in Bethany. And that the code word, the Lord needs them, was established in advance with someone. Jesus had been planning his entrance for a while. The timing was perfect. Jesus knew Jerusalem would be crowded with pilgrims for Passover. The law required all adult Jews and males who lived within 20 miles of Jerusalem to come to the Passover. And not only they came, but the Jews from all over the known world traveled to Jerusalem for this festival. Jerusalem would be jam-packed with tens of thousands of expected, expected visitors focused on the Passover. This was the time for Jesus to make a statement for all to see. The 
Jewish leaders were already plotting to kill Jesus. The most dangerous way Jesus could enter the city was in broad daylight with a lot of attention and noise from thousands of spectators. And that's exactly what he did. Jesus courageously made himself a sacrificial lamb entering the city. He knew those who hated him and wanted him dead would be triggered. But his actions and decisions were based on doing God's will rather than on how the man in power would react. Jesus was courageous, and he calls us to be courageous also. Do you think there is a lack of courage in your life? <clears throat> On a scale of 1 to 10, and you can't say 7, everyone always says 7. So that's not an option. How courageous are you? Let's be specific. If you are courageous, you will do the right things regardless of the consequences. You will feel fear, but do it anyway. You would not stop at failure. You would risk being criticized. You will pursue purpose over comfort. I think Jesus was being courageous in each of those ways. To be courageous is to be Christ-like. To many of us are stopped by fear. Avoid failure and criticism. And are stuck in our comfortable lives with little meaning or purpose. The very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road as Jesus entered. This was a reception reserved for a king. Jesus, however, had no intention of taking political power like most kings. Jesus was only interested in becoming king in the hearts of each and every person. For his kingdom was not of this world. They shouted, Hosanna, which means save now. And comes from Psalms 118.25 that exactly what Jesus came to do. Remember, he did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? There were ten thousands of visitors in the city for Passover, and they had yet to be exposed to Jesus. So this is why so many were asking who he was. The crowd answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. The crowd called Jesus a prophet because they did not fully understand him. But those closest to Jesus, those who spent time with him, listened to him, engaged with him, and learned to obey him, knew exactly who he was. He was not a prophet or just a great moral teacher. He was more than that. He was not an earthly king. He was beyond an earthly king. Those who knew him called him the Messiah, the Son of God, who came into the world to save it, not to condemn it. You are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Jesus' friends, Martha, 
in John 11, 27, you're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus' disciple Peter in Matthew 16, 16, you know that this man really is the Savior of the world. The entire town of Sychar, after spending two days with Jesus in John 4, 42, the question is, who do you say that Jesus is? Is he a prophet? Is he a moral teacher? Or is he your Lord? Your absolute authority? C.S. Lewis said, Let us not say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher. But I don't accept him Accept his claim to be God. That is one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a, a lunatic or the level with the man who says he is a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit on him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord of God. But let us not come with uh, patronizing nonsense about his being a great moral teacher. He has not left that upon us. He did not intend to. So, who is Jesus? What does it matter to your life today? What does it matter to your life everlasting? There are difficult, these are difficult questions, but they're important ones. As we wrap up our series of Letting Go this coming week, I'd like you to think through these questions. Think about the people in your life that may also be struggling to answer them. Can you invite them to Easter Sunday? Can you encourage them to let go of all the sin, shame, doubt, and fear in their lives? May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.